Hello and welcome to the third session of the GCF Private Investment for Climate Conference entitled Deep Dive Supporting Innovative Adaptation Technologies and Ecosystem-Based Approaches and Services. My name is Ayaka Fuchiwara. I'm the Climate Investment Specialist at the GCF and I'm delighted to moderate this interesting discussion. For the benefit of those of you who are joining us through Hoover, I will remind you of a few housekeeping items. We invite you to submit your written questions or comment on the event platform Hoover. Live remote interpretation to French and Spanish is available. Participants are invited to select the language in which they would like to follow the entire session by clicking on the interpretation button at the bottom of the streaming window. Automated live captioning is available in several languages. Please note that uh, the link uh, is there in the session description within Hoover. Full video recording of the session will be available on Hoover after the session and later also on the event webpage. We hope that you will find this session useful. And again, we invite you to submit your questions or comments in writing through the Q&A function on Hoover. We will now proceed with the program. So in terms of the session context, climate change adaptation technologies and ecosystem-based approaches are the missing critical elements required to be scaled up to meet the widening adaptation gap, which currently is not sufficiently filled in adapt developing countries, thereby limiting their ability to adapt to climate change. Although climate adaptation flows have increased in recent years, it still falls short of funding needed to avoid severe economic and human impact from climate change, especially in developing countries. As previously pointed out, this financing gap is said to be billions of US dollars. In this session, we will introduce practical examples on how science behind adaptation blends with working business models. This session will then go to focus on the catalytic role of GCF in unlocking and enabling private capital to help finance national and local adaptation priorities, fundamentally focusing on ecosystem-based management. The session will explore the challenge private sector investors face in the climate adaptation space and how major impediments such as lack of viable adaptation business models, information asymmetry, and high-risk perceptions could be overcome to unlock the adaptation investment conundrum. The session will further explore the pivotal role that GCF could play in overcoming these barriers and in turn supporting the most vulnerable to the impact of climate change. Now, I have the distinct honor of introducing to you the panelists of this session. First, I'd like to welcome Dr. Kevin Horsborough, the climate science lead at the Green Climate Fund. Kevin brings along over 25 years of experience in the modeling uh, the impacts of climate change. His role mainstreams the latest climate science, modeling, and impact assessment methods into the development of projects and programs to better accelerate low emission and climate resilient development pathways to work with developing countries and project developers to access the climate information that they need to improve access to climate finance. Secondly, I'd like to introduce Ms. Lisa Genasi, the founder and CEO of ADM Capital Foundation, which supports critical research and impact-driven approaches to environmental conservation in Asia. Along with UN Environment and BNP Paribas, ADM Group created the Tropical Landscapes Finance Facility to catalyze green growth projects that improve rural livelihood and promote sustainable land use in Indonesia. Third, I'd like to welcome Dr. Tony Nyong, Director of Climate Change and Green Growth at the African Development Bank. He's currently on secondment to the Global Center on Adaptation as the Regional Director for Africa. He has about 30 years of experience in environmental and natural resources management, environmental and social safeguards, renewable energy and green growth that span academia, private sector and development finance. Fourth, I'd like to welcome Mr. Manav Pansal, CEO of Need Fund. Manav has been a private equity investor and investment banker for 24 years in sustainability, uh, infrastructure, healthcare, and technology. 
He's a chief investment officer for NIF Fund 1 and 2 that have a nearly US dollar worth of 300 million asset under management and is a thought leader in sustainable investing and promoting ESG practices in small and medium enterprises in India. Last but not least, I'd like to welcome Mr. Carlos Sanche, Executive Director for the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment, the CCRI, a flagship COP26 initiative led by the private sector and has a membership of 120 institutions representing US dollar 20 trillion committed to the development and testing, testing of solutions for resilient investment decision making. Carlos is also the Climate Resilience Investment Director at Willis Towers Watson, where his work focuses on the integration of physical climate risks in asset valuation and investment uh, decision-making processes. So I'd like to now start with the questions. So Kevin, as the climate science lead of the GCF, you have successfully shaped the climate rationale of the private sector project. Could you share with us how GCF has engaged in adaptation projects to achieve the necessary impact, please. Over Thank to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Aka, for that introduction. And um, good evening, good morning, or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll, I'll begin, if I may, by setting the scene. I'm just going to show a couple of slides to give some examples. So I'm just going to sh quickly share my screen. Aka, if you could confirm when you're seeing my screen, please, that would be yes. very helpful. We can see it right now. Maybe you can, if you can put it on screen share. Yeah, that's perfect. Excellent. So um, th this meeting takes place just two weeks before the start of COP26 in Glasgow, um, where our world leaders have the chance to take decisive action on climate change, recognising that the worst effects can still be avoided if we act immediately to boost global ambition for both mitigation and adaptation. And as the most recent IPC assessment warns, at the current rate of greenhouse gas emissions, we're likely to exceed the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal of the Paris Agreement before 2040. Even if we do take immediate action and manage to meet the 1.5 degrees goal, there's still high confidence that heavy rainfall and associated flooding will increase in most regions of Africa and Asia. And this just underlines the need um, for us to urgently boost the investment in climate adaptation and resilience. We've heard in other sessions today that adaptation costs across developing countries are estimated at around 70 billion US dollars. And this figure is expected to reach somewhere between 140 to 300 billion by 2030. And although climate adaptation finance flows have increased in recent years, they're still nowhere near what's needed to avoid serious impacts on people's lives, livelihoods and ecosystem services. Recent estimates show that only 7% of, of climate finance has gone towards adaptation. So it's clear that finance for adaptation needs to be stepped up urgently, and the involvement of the private sector is vital due to the scale of the problem and the fact that the adaptation gap is still widening. And a climate policy initiative CPI report from 2017-18 um, showed that just 1.6% 1, 1 of adaptation funding came from private sources. Uh, and we know it's difficult because adaptation is targeted on often non-market sectors and public goods, and that creates challenges. But there's a strong economic case for investing in adaptation. Uh, analysis by the Global Commission on Adaptation recently showed that um, investing 1.8 trillion US dollars over five key target areas between 2020 and 2030 could produce $7.1 trillion in benefits. So with that introduction, um, I'd like to introduce two projects. Um, where the GCF has been able to use our catalytic position to crowd in significant private finance. So the GCF is the anchor investor in the Acumen Resilient Agriculture Fund, which makes small investments of between one to three million US dollars in agricultural enterprises in both East and West Africa. The fund's aims are to support pioneering and early growth agribusinesses that enhance climate resilience for the smallholder farmers of those regions. And the fund invests in platform businesses, which improve smallholder farmers access to and integration with the market. Uh, they also provide digital solutions that enhance supply chain visibility and efficiency. And finally, financial services such as innovative payment, credit and insurance solutions to farmers at scale. 
an initial technical assistance grant, and this shows how Drupal is able to, to take these blended finance positions. Uh, so an initial technical uh, finance grant of, of 3 million US dollars was then accompanied by a 23 million dollar junior equity stake. And that investment was matched by senior equity investors, including a development bank, a foreign direct investors, and a philanthropic source. And this fund has now invested in solar irrigation and climate services, as well as contract farming schemes with strong forward linkages to food processing. Um, and investments have also been made in dairy farming through irrigation and other goods and services. So this first of its kind adaptation-focused agriculture fund is already develop, uh, delivering adaptation benefits to those uh, 10 million beneficiaries that you can see on the slide. And it demonstrates how the GCF is able to de-risk and crowd in private investment. And my second example is the Global Fund for Coral Reefs Investment Window, which was approved at our recent GCF board meeting just two weeks ago. And here, GCF is providing the catalytic equity to mobilize private sector investment in order to reverse the degradation of coral reef ecosystems and prevent a tipping point in coral reefs worldwide. The 150 million US dollars of GCF junior equity will unlock and de-risk private investment to create a $500 million fund to enhance the adaptive capacity of coral reef ecosystems and the communities that depend upon them. And of course, coral reefs are a, a crucial marine ecosystem, but they also protect coastal areas by reducing wave energy um, and storm damage. And, and most importantly, they provide food security and livelihoods to more than 1 billion people worldwide through the economic activities that they generate. And you can see this see the scale um, of the benefits for this program on the slide there at the bottom. So the, the, the GC, GFCR investment window is going to enable the financing of between 20 to 30 companies, projects, platforms across three target sectors. Firstly, sustainable ocean production to address overfishing and destructive fishing techniques, uh, thus improving restoration. Secondly, by addressing unsustainable tourism. And thirdly, by investing in sustainable infrastructure that reduces pollution. Uh, and key to the design and the approval of this program were the tools necessary to transparently screen and monitor projects throughout the due, due diligence process across, across their lifetimes in order to demonstrate climate impact. And during the design phase, our team worked very closely with the accredited entity, Pegasus Capital Advisors, to agree eligibility criteria for potential investees and investment principles. And through a parallel grant fund, the program links to the philanthropic community in order to provide technical assistance and capacity building at the institutional level, uh, enabling the private and the public sectors to work together. So just to finish off, um, many people may have seen a report published earlier this year in March by the World Bank entitled Enabling Private Investment in Climate Adaptation and Resilience. And that report sets out a blueprint for action to accelerate private investment. And we've heard many speakers in other sessions already during this conference making those same calls for action on the adaptation frontier. And so just to finish to say the GCF is ready to offer full support um, through our private sector strategy, which focuses on climate oriented financial systems, green banks, green markets and institutions, and de-risking de the barriers to investment so that we can turn those billions into trillions. Thank you. Many thanks, Kevin. That's a great presentation of our adaptation projects that we've done. I'd like to move on to uh, the next question to Lisa. So through the successful launch of Tropical Landscapes Finance Facility, financed by both private and public capital in a unique public-private partnership modality, um, ADM Capital Foundation is expected to bring long-term financing to Indonesian projects and companies uh, that stimulate green growth and improve rural livelihoods. This was a significant project given its role in mobilizing international capital at scale to incentivize sustainable agriculture and renewable energy at the grassroots. Could you provide us, tell us more about your journey in developing the Tropical Landscape Finance Facility and perhaps share your insight on how ADM Capital pushed the changes more broadly by touching upon other investment priorities? Yeah, thanks very much Ayaka and uh, good morning, good evening. 
So as uh, Ayaka has said in her intro, the Tropical Landscapes Finance Facility for Indonesia is an initiative of the ADM Capital Group, the broad group. So the ADM Capital Foundation and ADM Capital, which is a private credit manager based in Hong Kong, BNP Paribas, UN Environment and the World Agroforestry Center. Uh, we were launched by the government of Indonesia, uh, including the Minister of, of Coordinating Economic Affairs, the President's Office, the Ministry of Environment and Forestry in 2016. And with a UN, manage, a UN environment managed secretariat in Jakarta, the objective of the TLFF is to support Indonesians' emissions reduction and poverty alleviation targets uh, with a sort of a, a, through a climate lens. So how, how are we expected to do that? And how do we feel that we can, we can uh, make change through finance? Um, that is really by catalyzing finance into agriculture commodity projects that incorporate conservation and community into the investment thesis and perhaps more importantly into the loan documents so that there is teeth actually in the in the project so I, I think we all we need to ask the question why indonesia and why the land use sector these are perhaps the first questions to before i proceed with more information about the tlff and that is because indonesia has the third largest remaining forest globally um, and at the same time is the fourth or fifth larger emit, largest emitter of greenhouse gases and more than 60% of these emissions are from land use change. So from uh, forest to agriculture or peatlands to agriculture. And a main driver of deforestation and peat degradation in Indonesia um, has been palm oil expansion, as we know. Furthermore, when planting palm oil, too much water is often extracted in commodity production. Pollution can be rampant and species eradicated when forest is lost or burned. So in this way, land can be a major contributor to climate change, both in terms of emissions and, um, and lost removals. So adaptation finance is fundamental to this story. Indonesia produces 60% of the global supply of palm oil and has um, prioritized palm oil as a key commodity to support a national biofuel plan. Part of the challenge that's perhaps not always fully taken on board when we talk about palm oil commodities broadly in, in a place like Indonesia is that 40% of palm oil is produced by smallholders small who sometimes open forested areas as their existing trees on their small holdings age and become less, um, less productive. They need to increase their income, so they simply open new land. Smallholders are also responsible for 90% of rubber production and about the same, I believe, for cocoa and coffee. And of course, all of these commodities can be drivers of deforestation and they're all critical commodities for Indonesia. So the problem is not the products themselves. So many campaigns run against the products themselves, but it's how they've been produced. And the issue becomes then how to transition production to be better, more inclusive and deforestation free. How do, we, um, how do we make sure that community livelihoods don't suffer, that smallholders have access to credit for replanting and agricultural extension services to learn better practices, that they have access to high quality seeds and inputs so their families can thrive even in a changing climate. Of course, there is need to balance the conservation and community aspects while making sure that production is commercial if we're talking about finance. So these are critical undertakings um, since all pathways to limiting warming to 1.5 degrees rely on negative emissions. The so estimates are that nature-based solutions can deliver one third of the mitigation needed to reach that target. And business as usual, land use involves investment where there is no consideration beyond profit. We then need to invest in business unusual land use and perhaps holding us back is how we perceive risk in the, uh, in the land use sector. Many investors think of nature-based solutions as inherently risky. They now involve multiple partnerships and many different players, the, the many different players and the sort of the conversation around adaptation scares uh, many investors and introduces risk and uncertainty into the equation. And many involve smallholder credit risk, but we need to redefine and redevalue risk for land use projects to incorporate all of the above. Um, and that will be an important part of our transition to low carbon economies. So mobilization of private capital at scale for this purpose is absolutely fundamental. So that was another objective in 2018 uh, when TLFF launched its first project, which was a $95 million sustainability bond for a natural rubber company with concessions across 90,000 hectares of uh, largely degraded land in two provinces in Indonesia. 
And the collective objective of the Tropical Landscapes Finance Facility was to transform a biodiversity hotspot and highly degraded area that had been devastated by illegal logging over many years and encroachment into an innovative and sustainable um, natural rubber project. I guess the big prize in this case, uh, the Jambi concessions, concessions in East Kalimantan and Jambi. And the Jambi concessions are adjacent to 143,000 he hectare national park, which uh, was at risk from encroachment. So the commercial plantations and a 9,700 hectare wildlife conservation area that was created in the concessions along the southern border of the national park serve as that sort of functional buffer zone to help protect against encroachment. A lot of people talk about that, but in this project, that is that is that has been built into the project. So the bond benefited, going back to the sort of the the blended finance aspects of this uh, um, of this project, the sort of public private aspects of the project also. Um, the bond benefited from a partial USAID guarantee. It was tranched by tenor between 15 and five years, according to investor appetite, and obviously the, the company's need for longer tenor capital, um, given the, the fact that it takes up to seven years, five to seven years for a rubber tree to come online. There is need for longer tenor capital, and we see that with smallholders too, uh, working in agriculture commodities. Tranche A was rated AAA by Moody's. Um, tranche B was sold without a guarantee, largely to uh, impact investors. And BMP arranged and sold the bond and ADM Capital is the facility manager and provides ESG support to the project. So in this project, there are multiple partnerships, grant support to community conservation, the adaptation aspects to help deliver a project that is both commercially viable and working towards ENS compliance in a really challenging landscape. There are 50,000 people living in and around the concessions. Um, and the, the company understands that in order to operate in, a, in this very challenging landscape, it needs a social license to operate, which means a strong community partnership program, as well as building and of course the, the sort of conservation aspects of HCB, HCS assessments and uh, determination uh, as to planting and no plant areas. So the ADM Capital Group and its partners uh, are acting to catalyze the change that's required and we're seeing the need and yes the opportunity to invest in agriculture commodities in Asia to promote better supply chains, better land use practices and food production um, that's non-detrimental and climate positive. Uh, we've learned a lot from this particular project. Specifically, we're building a, a pipeline of projects for private lending in Indonesia, but with flexibility in terms of the size of the transaction, which we don't have under TLFF. Uh, the Asian Development Bank estimates, estimates that Asian demand for agricultural investment is $120 billion a year. So and at the same time, I think unmet Indonesian demand for replanting older and lower yielding smaller tree hold, uh, smallholder tree crops alone is believed to require well over $1 billion annually. So part of the thesis has to be that if smallholders aren't trained, incentivized to intensify production on existing lands through credit, we won't solve the deforestation problem. And also that technology is key, traceability, digitizing farmers, credit scoring, all be essential to scaling any investment. So we've created something called the Asia Climate Smart Land Use Fund with targets and GHG emissions of reduction uh, better land management practices and improved livelihoods with a focus on gender. Um, we have letters of intent from DFC to provide an asset level guarantee from an international NGO to act as impact manager for the fund as well as an MP, an LP. So that, that is a fund that's in progress. Um, I'll stop there. Thanks, Ayaka. Thank you so much. That's a lot of uh, interesting learning that we could definitely take on. Many thanks for sharing. I'd like to um, move on to Tony. So as the Global Center of Adaptation for Adaptation is a relatively new organization, how do you plan to engage with governments and private sector to mainstream adaptation activities among other countries, such as LDCs and SIDS? Would the GCA contemplate launching innovative initiatives, such as public-private partnership for climate adaptation, to efficiently allocate perceived private sector risks? Over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Ayaka, for the question. And let me thank the organizers for the invitation to be at this event. The GCF is very close to my heart. Uh, I keep saying that I spent a year of my life working to set up the GCF many years ago. So it's really very important to me and I like what the GCF is doing. 
Um, as you all know, or you may know, the Global Center on Adaptation is um, you know, upon the sunset of the Global Commission on Adaptation. And it is the only international organization that is so established to solely address issues of resilience and adaptation. We currently have offices and operations in Southeast Asia, China, and Africa. And our purpose is simple, scale up and accelerate adaptation and resilience, especially for regions on the front line, including these seats you've mentioned, the small island, there's the small island development states, many of the LDCs, or the LDCs, many of them are in Africa. As a global solutions broker for adaptation, the GCA, that's the Global Center on Adaptation, has joined forces with the African Development Bank to establish a brand new, uh, a brand new adaptation plan that's very bold, you know, that focuses on four bold ideas. The first is how do we transform our agriculture, modernize it and make it a ride on the on climate, not when it rains, we eat. If it doesn't rain, we starve. How do we build in digital technologies into it, particularly for smallholders who form the bulk of Africa's uh, farmers? And then the second one is how do we build resilience into Africa's infrastructure? Knowing that 70% of Africa's infrastructure is yet to be built, and we focus more on nature based solutions because that's what Africa has an advantage over. Most of my talks are going to be based on the African continent. And the third is how do we work with our youth? We have a youthful population. Median age in Africa is 17, 19.7 years. These are kids. You know, those, these young ones could either be an asset or a liability. So we're turning them into an asset, not a liability, by ensuring that every project that goes off any mill has jobs created. And not just jobs, not just green jobs, jobs in the resilience space. We have evidence to show that uh, development in the development in, in the adaptation space generates quite a lot of interest and capacity to address uh, the challenges. And then the next is on innovative financing initiatives. Things have changed. The COVID came, a lot of people spent a lot of money, over $20 trillion invested. We need to find other innovative ways of addressing uh, our climate challenges. So what we've done is we are uniquely placed to connect different types of stakeholders from the international to the local, from the government to the private sectors, you know, to complement each other in driving adaptation. So it is critically important, let me stress, that the private sector is crucial in adaptation. Why am I saying so? An estimated 75% of adaptation finance will have to come from the private sector. That's true, but we need to bring them in, not just to mitigation, but also to adaptation. Today, the private sector is hardly stepping into that role. Only 3% of private finance linked to development is spent on adaptation. And if the private sector investment keeps lagging behind, so will the entire adaptation also lag behind. In terms of whether we're contemplating launching innovative ideas, I can tell you we're not, we're not contemplating doing that. We are already doing that. In September this year, we developed and launched a toolkit for public-private partnerships that integrate climate adaptation and resilience into infrastructure. And we did this in partnership with the large MDBs. This toolkit provides important guidance to public and private actors on how to develop effective PPPs for resilient infrastructure. This is not very common. To ensure that capacity constraints are not blocking progress, the GCA has also launched the Climate Resilient Infrastructure Officer Program, where those group of people, procurement engineers, and are certified as climate resilient infrastructure officers because we want to build that capacity. We are training public and private officers to develop PPPs for resilient infrastructure. The first 46 officers were trained in September, drawn from the financial institutions, governments, and the private sector. This has been well received. And after that, several, several countries have requested that we develop and deliver dedicated training sessions for them. And I can tell you that we are doing more. We are working to overcome 
two key barriers or challenges to private sector participation in adaptation. These are limited awareness of the positive cost-benefit ratios of adaptation and insufficient incentives to invest. We are demonstrating that adaptation, investing in adaptation is good economics. And I'm surprised why many people are not rushing into it. Through our work on the state and trends in adaptation reports that we've, we've just published, we are making knowledge on cost benefit ratios for investment in several sectors widely available for public and private actors. Some key findings, we already had uh, the first one, but I can tell you that mainstreaming resilience into infrastructure has 3% of additional costs upfront. Yes, but has a return of $4 for every $1 spent down the line. And for water and sanitation projects, cost-benefit ratios range between one to two and one to 12. And then where people don't go in most, which is most critical for resilience, is in weather and climate information services. And their cost-benefit ratios could go as much as one to 25. We are doing a lot on nature-based solutions. We've developed toolkits, we've developed a business plan, you know, a business idea. Why would the private sector want to go into nature-based solutions? You know, so we've developed a business model that that works with. So I'm extremely very glad to hear Lisa of the ADM Capital Foundation, you know, what they are doing in financing nature. Recent studies have shown that ecosystem restoration creates 3.7 times as many jobs as oil and gas production per dollar. As a roundup, through our Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program, we are working to mobilize innovative finance, like I've mentioned, to de-risk and enable private sector investments. I'll give you an instance. We've worked with EBRD to publish a toolkit for issuing resilience bonds. And we are working with the African Development Bank to issue the first resilience bond on the African continent that could attract up to a billion Dollars. We have other financing initiatives we're working on, like the Africa Financial Alliance on Climate Change. It brings everybody in the financial sector. You can't do these things piecemeal. Everybody needs to be around the table so that they understand how the central bank's decisions and policies will affect the uh, commercial banks, how commercial bank activities will affect impact investors, and so on, and insurance companies. So we've brought these teams together on the African continent, and we're working together to unlock a lot of resources we implement. We're working on green banks, uh, like we mentioned. And then we're not just focusing on the big corporations. Anybody working on the African continent knows that the bulk of Africa's private sector is in micro, small, and medium enterprises. And so what we've done is we've designed a facility that allows small businesses to be incubated over a period and scaled up so that they can become commercially viable. That we think is a very important, how we build private sector right from the grassroots. And we're also trying to enable governments to do more. African countries are buried under huge debts, debts that only increased during the COVID-19 crisis. As a result, they have fiscal constraints, hampering investments in adaptation. So what are we doing? We're working on debt for climate swaps. And we're already talking to, with two countries, Gabon and Kenya, to make sure that that becomes a reality. Through all these efforts and many more, the GCA is engaging the government and the private sector to make adaptation activities mainstream. We've, if we don't do that, right now, adaptation finance is about 10%, mitigation 90%. And if we don't build that momentum, then we will continue to have what we So GCA is very, strong are doing that. And if we do not achieve the parity, we will make much progress. And as a leader in this agenda, it is crucial that we set an example. And therefore, we look forward to working more closely with the GCF to ensure that what we were set up to do, to change the narrative, to cause a step change in adaptation, that that will happen even within the GCF. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Tony. That's truly thought-provoking. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'd like to uh, now move on to Manav. 
So taking off from Tony's point, uh, it does seem interesting that the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and India's largest bank, State Bank of uh, India, have come together to under under a government to government initiative to set up the NEEP One Fund, focusing on climate value chain investment in the MSME space. Could you perhaps share how NEEP creatively balanced the commercial imperative of investing companies with impact orientation of uh, your investors? How do you, in your investment process, handle this conflict? Over to you. Thank you, Ayaka, and um, uh, congratulations on really professionally organized event. Um, also, uh, it's, it, one of the objective for us to be here was not to speak as much to learn, and it was fascinating to hear uh, Lisa speak about how could you bring smallholders with, with long-term finance, uh, two absolutely contradictory elements that they've been able to bring together. And fascinating to hear Tony, uh, when he mentioned that they have offices in Southeast Asia, China, and Africa, there just seems to be a big mass of India, which is absent. So I'm sure at some point in time, they would want to also bring that expertise to India, and we would be very happy to happy to hear from them. Uh, I'll try and keep it brief, Aika, because I know Carlos has to speak, and then it goes to the audience. So, uh, yeah, NEEF Fund is actually I think is is actually a unique initiative, which was launched by the Prime Ministers of India and UK. It does provide long-term private capital and climate value chain investments in MSME space, particularly in geographies and sectors that had been starved of investment. Essentially, as far back as in 2016, Neve actually started investing in climate and interface geographies. In built the in the design of Neve is to create a portfolio of projects that demonstrate innovation and high impact with clearly defined poverty, gender, and climate targets while integrating the ESG in its value chain. Given the common development agenda between FCDO and State Bank of India, and given State Bank of India's reach in India. It was clearly a natural house to have NEEF Fund in India. Over a period of time, NEEF Fund has developed a unique model of sustainability investing, one that is not just limited to the beneficiary of the enterprise that you mentioned, Ayaka, but also helps shape the policy that impacts the ecosystem at large, mints broken markets, and makes sectors sustainable. So essentially, we are going to take three steps beyond just investment. We try and create sustainable markets where not only our com companies uh, prosper, industries get made, and there is a regulatory certainty, which sometimes, given the climate investments, is a key su success factor. We have invested in new areas that build climate resilience. These include climate resilient silo, agri silo infrastructure that helps deliver food security and provides poorer farmers with an option to effectively store grain, essentially in the regions that are vulnerable to climatic variabilities and disturbances. Another interesting investment made by the fund is in a dairy supply chain that help create alternative sources of income for coastal farmers that have micro or extremely small land holdings and are particularly vulnerable to increased cyclonic episodes in the Bay of Bengal due to climatic change. The, our investments has resulted in increase of income by 15%, wherein about 50% of the people live in extreme poverty. After NEEB investments, our portfolio companies have raised as much as three to four times the investment that we have made and are positively impacting about 4 million lives. We have... Uh, about 3, 300 investments, and we have generated about 125 green jobs per million dollar investment, which is perhaps higher than averages in most developed countries. The key element that we have spoken about is that the investment in NEV is not only about investment in portfolio companies, but in the entire ecosystem. And in NEV Fund 2, which is a successor fund, we are going to increasingly uh, push uh, areas of clean energy, water, green infrastructure, disaster resilient infrastructure, sustainable agriculture. And the parentage of NEV fund allows us to represent not only the portfolio companies, but also the ecosystem itself with the policymakers. NEV fund is actually seen as an honest broker and investment expert, and policymakers listen and act on the recommendation of the fund, ensuring attractive commercial returns and a meaningful impact in the climate action. 
And I will stop there because I know Carlos has to go after me and you have to get audiences after that. Thank you so much, Aika, for having us here. Thank you so much, my love. Truly an interesting insight. And uh, last but not least, Carlos. <laughs> All right, Carlos, in your work, you advise clients on incorporating climate risks in their uh, investment decision making. Could you share some interesting insights about three innovative ways in which private sector investors or companies have built in elements on climate risks in specific investment decisions in the ecosystem space? Over to you. Thank you. Ayaka, thank you very much. And uh, wonderful contributions from the previous speaker. So I feel bad to add to the pressure of the, of the flow, but uh, wonderful to be here. Thank you so much, ECF. Thank you to everyone that is dialing today to be with us in this in this good session. Um, and thanks for the question, Ayaka, because I, it's it's a great opportunity to indeed build in so many elements that have been wonderfully brought up by previous speakers. And and I I, I would like to start with Kevin's point about the analytical challenge that, that we are facing and about to what extent incentives are really bringing or not the right enforcement and the right reward to the integration of physical climate risk in investment decision making. Because that is at the heart of both the work of the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment, but of course also within Willis Charles Watson, is to help institutional investors, the financial industry globally, but also globally speaking, public and private actors, to understand how to better manage what we consider to be a very acute mispricing of physical climate risk in investing, and indeed a form of market failure. And I believe that has also been uh, uh, brought up previously earlier today. And, and, and at the heart of that uh, market failure, it's a, it's a challenge with the information. It's a challenge with climate data, as in for the purpose of investment decision making, but for that purpose for any decision making is to understand how projected exposure to both chronic and acute risks is going to affect the desired outcome of our decision, of an initial effort. And that can be cross-benefit analysis, that can be cash flow modeling, that can be discounted free cash flow modeling, that can be many forms, but at the end of the day is the same, is discounting future effects and, and making a decision if it is worth to invest an effort on an ex-ante basis. So, um, very quickly, starting with the client side, so more on the Willis Towers Watson. But if you allow me, Ayaka, I would like to maybe kind of rapidly go to the client, to the coalition side. Uh, but at the at the client side, as we all know here, there's been a deep transformation in the global financial financial industry that we could maybe start uh, pinpoint the start of which to September 2015 with Mark Carney's speech, Tragedy of the Horizons in London. And up to that point, we all considered that physical climate risk, climate risk were a very important consideration, but maybe more belonging to the realm of the ethical and reputational considerations in investment decision making. Uh, since then, there has been a, a very deep transformation, not of the actors that are here, that I believe that are uh, 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 you know, convinced and, and thought leaders for a long, long time, but for that skeptical sector within the global financial industry that didn't believe that these were critical and strategic considerations. So from our perspective at Willis Tower Watson, what we witnessed was an in incredibly deep transformation in what we could call the exam question. So let's say in 2016, the exam question was, tell me something about climate risk. What is this thing about climate risk? Why I need to care about it? And the answer could be a composite of regulatory pressure, growing regulatory pressure, but also an, an opportunity. Uh, also at that stage, at that point in time, analytics were able to deliver to, up to a certain point. And we are seeing how analytics are growing exponentially, but also uh, at the same pace, the exam question and the sophistication of actors is also growing. So it's really kind of at the same, at the same speed. So the discussion has evolved from, tell me something about climate risk to Tell me something about the real asset uh, portion of my investment portfolio in current basis. But now we are starting to get into the real heart of the matter, that is evaluation. It's to say, I understand I'm currently exposed to this risk, but what is exposure in mid and long term? And most critically, how based on that exposure, you can reconsider or interrogate my balance sheet value to to that to that particular asset and with that we really get into a whole different different 
dimension. So that is also at the heart of the motivation of the coalition for climate resilient investment, where we are bringing collaboration across critical regions, industries, sectors, and institutions to not only let's say get together to, to write a report, but actually to work together towards the development of very particular solutions in three key levels of infrastructure decision making. That is national planning, where we are finalizing a tool for the government of Jamaica uh, that is a national investment prioritization tool, a tool that will tell uh, the, the Ministry of Finance where f uh, constrained fiscal resources will protect the most economic, social, and ecosystem value in Jamaica over 20 years. It is not a surprise that in such an innovative project, uh, GCF is very central to it, and there's, there are no words to, to express the gratitude for the leadership and, and support uh, uh, from, from GCF, uh, Katarzyna Rudizio, uh, uh, let's say particularly. But then we are also working at the asset level, and at the asset level, working very much at the cash flow modeling dimension to all this challenge, we are working in developing three solutions. One is the PICRAN, the Physical Climate Risk Assessment Methodology. It's a tool that, thanks to the champion, uh, uh, being championed by Maud McDonald, that they have dedicated nine colleagues over a year, working together with 25 other institutions, they have developed this methodology that allows you to interrogate CAPEX, OPEX, and depreciation levels in a particular asset. Uh, not only that, but this methodology also issues, also issues resilience options or resilient recommendations for incremental investment. So let's call it Delta CapEx. And that is then taken, and also big thanks to SMP uh, for advancing with us the resilience credit quality drivers. So basically guidance that allows for a simulation of credit quality in recognition of resilience options. And I believe that Lisa wonderfully eluded and emphasized the role of credit quality in this discussion. We need to, let's say, crack that nut very, very quickly. And we believe to be to be there. Uh, I, I, Jack, I, I believe that I may, I may be running over time. I see you suffering. Should, should, should I take like a two additional minutes? Maybe one, Carlos, if that's okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so Absolutely. much. No problem at all. No problem at all. So what we are seeing is a, very, a lot of excitement, not only in the solutions per se, but actually from uh, jurisdictions. The government of California integrated the PCRAM. Um, institutional investors, multilaterals, and asset managers in adopting and piloting this. I will finish with the point on nature, nature based solutions ecosystem, because that is crucial. And we are working on case studies that showcase the financial value as associated to the existence of a nature based solution, natural capital asset associated to a traditional one. I also wanted to, and I promise this is uh, the last 10 seconds, Ayaka, acknowledge the, the incredible support from the GCA. Uh, that was very early on with uh, CCRI supporting us in our launch in 2019 at the General Assembly of the UN. But I'll stop there. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you so much, Carlos. And I do wish we had more time. But I wanted to uh, take some questions uh, at the end for, from the live audience because we still have a few minutes left and I'd like to open the floor to the questions. So uh, we have some incoming questions. I'll just... Uh, read them as, uh, as I receive them. So this is going to be maybe a question for Lisa and Manaf, potentially, if you'd like to take them. What is the roadmap to transition from the grant uh, financing to equity and debt financing in the climate adaptation finance space, in your opinion? Um, Lisa or Manav, would you like to take that question? Go ahead, Lisa. I mean. Just had a wonderful example. Why didn't you take it? Uh, let, let go ahead. I mean, I, I would just say that uh, transition from um, grant to um, from grant to finance, um, it, it's it's involving the finance sector right from the beginning. So you might have a project that is evolving, that is has potential, that is being incubated. I think you heard uh, from our panelists the opportunity in certain cases to sort of to uh, be part of an incubator program and to sort of develop a proper business plan and, and finance aspects associated with the project but um, if, if that project is to be seriously financed by the by the public by the private sector it needs it needs someone sort of involved from the finance sector right from the beginning so that we're not uh, you're not sort of wasting time, I guess, and, and moving down a direction that's just not going to work. So it's sort of the, the grant is supportive, but the private sector finance has to come in right at the beginning. But Manav, please supplement. 
No, thanks. Just, just a quick one, uh, Aika. I think uh, one of the fascinating things that we have seen work beautifully is when you combine the grant with private finance. Uh, and that is where you can bring in the technical assistance programs from various multilaterals with private finance. And we've seen it work wonders. Uh, it, 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 like Lisa says, it course corrects you so you're not going down the wrong path. It also enables you to take initial risks, which otherwise private, private finance by itself would not have been able to do. Um, and you know, at Nefund, we've done it multiple times. And I think that is that is a so to say a, a differentiator we found, uh, which attracts more and more private capital because there is this credible work that the technical assistance does behind which the private capital is able to come forward. I, I'm not sure whether I answered that question or made any sense, but hopefully. Oh, answers. absolutely. This is very useful. Thank you so much. Maybe Manav, um, could the need fund um, speak how are how they are. Um, how does the fund monitor climate performance and benefits to poor people, um, for example, beyond a, perhaps a plausible livelihood impact contributing to dairy producers' uh, economic resilience? Could you uh, maybe give us some examples? So a short answer to that is, is exactly what we spoke about in the previous question, using the grant money. So using the grant money, we're actually able to do impact assessments uh, across various initiatives that we have, um, including uh, including interviews with the beneficiaries, including data analytics, perhaps not to the extent that Tony mentioned, um, and that was fascinating to hear the metrics that, that they have developed. And we would, we would really be happy to learn from that. But there again, when you are, uh, when you have grant capital working with, with investment capital, you do have some of these tools or some of these innovations that you can bring into your, into your work. I do want to squeeze uh, one more question, and that is uh, primarily for uh, Tony and uh, Carlos. So given that smallholder farmers have limited access to financial services, and there is low agriculture insurance penetration, that would uh, protect them from the vagaries of weather. What kind of structures or funding um, for agriculture insurance, premiums, digital services can be provided in your opinion? Um, Tony or Carlos, uh, whoever wants to go first. Okay, maybe I'll just take 30 seconds. Yeah, we have the, uh, for instance, the, the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program I talked about, it has four pillars. The first pillar is on climate advisory services and digital technologies. When you look at the blueprint that was developed, print, uh, published for digital services for agriculture, Africa is black. It's highly vulnerable, not ready, not using it. And so it creates an issue. What we have done is we have proposed under that several micro types of micro insurance schemes. We have at a larger global, sorry, continental level, the Africa risk capacity, where you subscribe to you pay your premiums. And when a disaster strikes, they are able to give you payouts. And those payouts are usually comfortable. Several of those payouts have been made, but several countries are finding it difficult to sustain insurance. What we are doing innovative uh, methodologies for financing disaster risk called ADRIFI, you know, and Africa disaster risk has a comp several the large scale insurance, the resilience uh, initiatives that we talked about. So there are so many out there, and then also make sure that they do not suffer the impacts as much and abandoned the way uh, they have been done so far. When we reach out to them with digital solutions, we actually make sure that they have access to digital solutions, particularly among the women for, yeah. Thank you so much, Tony. Carlos, would you like to take this question? Uh, uh, very little. I mean, uh, Anthony, what, what a pity that you, uh, we couldn't uh, hear completely, but uh, you, you're oh, definitely a leader from GCA and, and the African Development Bank. And we are certainly, uh, at least me, I understood the, the absolute uh, essence of what you what you explain and, and cannot agree more. I mean, maybe another way of saying is that um, with risk transfer solutions, uh, we need to tend to combine that top down, so more sovereign, uh, sovereign risk pools. 
uh, as ARC is really effectively doing. Although, you know, taking care of the, the, the basis risk, so that potential differential between the, the, the experience loss and the and the and they pay out but there is wonderful progress at that level and then at the bottom up with technical assistance with support technology provision but uh, i think that uh, very few of us can speak with the property of yourself anthony so i, I will just leave it with supporting with anthony just said thank you right thank you carlos thank you tony all right um so i guess we are coming to the end of this session and i'd like to thank you all very much for your interest and participation in this very stimulating discussion please note that the video recording of the session will be posted after the event on Cuba and later on the gcf website on behalf of the gcf i would like to thank lisa tony manav carlos and kevin for enthusiastically participating in the thought-provoking deliberations it was truly a pleasure and we look forward to finding a common ground to working with you all in the future. Uh, we invite you to visit our website at greenclimate.fund/events event, to learn about these events and other past and upcoming GCF events. We would like to thank the organizing team and the GCF at the, uh, at the GCF and the interpreters who supported us today. I'd like to especially thank my colleagues, Jisoo, Sylvie, Ryan, Anna, and Marcel, and the IT team who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this session possible today. Thank you.